Okay, we'll continue kind of our success theme for uh, the morning with uh, Brandon Ross. Um, Brandon is a, has over 15 years of senior technical management experience in network engineering and for leading organizations such as Comcast, University of Florida, InterNAP, everybody remembers InterNAP, right? MindSpring, uh, NetRail, Sockeye Networks, and uh, Zircom. Since 2010, Brandon has been a lead network engineering, or has led network engineering teams focusing on ar architecture, design, deployment, and training for enterprise, research, education, and international service provider networks. In 2011, Brandon formed Network Utility Force, an advanced network engineering and professional services company uh, comprised of highly experienced network and security architects aimed at addressing complex mission critical networks. So we're certainly pleased to have Brandon here today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So good morning. How is uh, everyone enjoying the uh, summit so far? Good? I know I am. Yeah. This is a great event for us every year. We, we love coming. We love uh, being around everybody who's uh, trying to deploy V6 and all that stuff. So um, it's always been a great event for us. It's been a little hectic for me this year, though, because, you know, the uh, cable tech show is going on at the same time down at the uh, convention center. So I've been running back and forth since we have a, a small presence there as well. Um, it's interesting over the, coming from the v, V6 perspective back and forth because the, uh, while there's certainly a lot of uh, uh, good progress on the cable side and deploying, deploying V6, a lot of the mid-sized to smaller providers over there still haven't um, really dug, in, dug into it much. You know, we know Comcast and the other big folks are making a lot more progress. So it's been an interesting dichotomy. Uh, I, if I was speaking earlier, I would have encouraged people to go over there too and check out uh, what's going on there. It's kind of cool, too, in that it's not just a technology show. You know, they have all their outside plant stuff there, so you can go play with, like, a bucket truck and a fiber termination trailer, and I, I don't really do that stuff a whole lot anymore, so it's kind of funny to see that now. But anyway, I'm Brandon Ross. I'm with Network Utility Force. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, a municipal Wi-Fi network that we deployed. Um, first, um, I want to talk a little bit about who I am and, and who Network Utility Force is. Uh, we go by NUF for short sometimes, and we have our table out there. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, I won't give you too much of a sales pitch, I promise. And then, uh, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the network deployment, uh, the area that we covered, and uh, kind of our, some of our results. So, uh, first of all, Network Utility Force, you know, we're a professional services organization, uh, as you heard in our introduction. Um, and we're very much based on uh, this, this system of core values and beliefs that we really believe in. Um, we picked this up, uh, most of us at least several of us worked at MindSpring back in the day, and that was always kind of cult-like, and um, um, it really built like an incredible environment. So I'm not going to go read them all to you or anything like that, but, but uh, we like to think that, that we focus very much on helping our clients and being honest with our clients about uh, what needs to be done and, and delivering technology that they need. Um, so who are we? we? We were founded in December of 2011. Um, so we've been around for almost three years now. Um, and going pretty strong. Uh, the IPv6 market has certainly helped us quite a bit in, in, our, in our growth over time. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of different lines of business, too. Um, I think we'll make probably about a million dollars this year in gross revenue. Um, so we're not huge. We're still very much a small boutique company. Uh, four of us are the principal owners and engineers, and all four of us um, that, uh, that are in the core group have all come from a long history of service providers. So, a uh, lot like you heard the list, uh, almost all of us worked at InterNAP at one point or another, um, but uh, MindSpring, Comcast, um, NetRail, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, we pull in all kinds of specialists as we need them. Um, the, things that, the things that I like people to know most about us is that um, you know, our reputation is probably the most important thing to everyone, and so we, we always try to uphold that. Um, and by, in order to do that, um, we always need to focus on uh, recommending the technologies or companies or whatever that our clients need without any bias. Um, and in order to have no bias in our company, we don't, we're not a VAR, we don't sell any equipment, we don't sell anybody's software, we don't sell anybody's systems. Um, we work very closely with all kinds of companies, um, everyone you've heard of and more, but uh, we're very careful to never be involved in the direct purchasing process or anything like that so that um, we always feel that we're able to give that neutral advice to folks. Um, and no geographical boundaries. We've done work all over the world. Um, we're pretty proud to help out uh, um, uh, Ethiopia not too long ago, I guess about a year ago, with their top-level uh, domain name. And I keep joking that I wanted to reserve uh, phone.home. It's phone.home.et. I never did it, though. But 
Um, core skills, so of course, you know, we know a lot about IPv6, I think, I hope. Um, hope learning more every day, just like everybody else, but uh, we've helped out quite a, quite a bit of companies with, with IPv6, a lot of them being service providers. Um, but, you know, core network, and, core network design and architecture is really our uh, core skill set, and uh, so that ties directly into things like MPLS and, and other technologies. Um, we can help companies with peering, especially service providers, obviously. Um, um, and one uh, very much growing area that we uh, that we help out uh, our clients with is on IP address acquisition um, and uh, and placement. So um, we do a lot of errand requests for our clients, basically. But uh, anything with IP address management, um, network security in these days uh, has been quite important too. We've gotten those panic calls from various enterprises, mostly. Um, oh my gosh, I think our credit card just got stolen. Can you help me? Um, and we'll, we always focus on the network part of that, right? We're not application folks. Um, but to keep from boring you too much, I'll move on here in a second. Um, but obviously, wireless packet networks is, is a big area of our, of our uh, business today as well. A lot of that's Wi-Fi, but it also can include point-to-multipoint stuff, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, uh, you know, uh, backhaul technologies. And of course, training. You know, our IPv6 training is, has become uh, very popular. Um, if you want to take a look at uh, our training offering, I have one of our class books back at the booth. If you want to flip through that, it's pretty thick that we put together. All right, so let's move on to the more interesting subject here, and I'll start stop boring you with my company. So the city of Douglasville, it's a it's a basically a bedroom community about 20 miles west of Atlanta. Uh, it was founded in the um, in uh, 1875, you know, when the railroad came to town, um, so it's you know it started as a railroad town and then evolved into this um, into this bedroom community for Atlanta. Um, 32,000 residents, and it's a uh, you know since it's an older town, it's on the historical register, um, which uh, which was a little bit interesting when we did our install there, just because we had to think about how things might look since we're covering the little downtown area, but we didn't actually run into any issues with it uh, uh, being on the register. Um, so Google um, has a, uh, a program where they give back to their local communities where their data centers are. There's a very sizable Google data center in the, uh, in the area, near just outside of Douglasville. Um, and so Google provided a grant for Douglasville to improve its downtown area and, some, and a few of the parks um, by installing a publicly accessible Wi-Fi network. Um, previous to... The install, there was you know, no real services um, in, in these areas, certainly not in the parks. Uh, a few of the uh, local businesses, of course, you know, coffee shops and that whatnot might have their own AP inside their, their, their premise, but there was no service outside of that in these, uh, in these public areas. Um, so Google reached out to, their, to the local community, to the mayor, to discuss how they might provide some funding and what the local community would like to do with the funding, how they would like to deploy this Wi-Fi network and what areas they wanted to cover. Um, so they worked together to, um, to start a search for a firm to come in and do some initial survey work and then eventually to install the network and luckily enough we were the ones to, uh, to bid on it and to win that project. Um, so just a, a general overview of what the deployment looks like and what it was planned to look like. It's over 100 acres in, in three major locations. So there's two parks and uh, one downtown area, a uh, little pedestrian mall area, a bit smaller than 16th Street here since it's a small town, but the same kind of general idea where there's shops and restaurants up and down a pedestrian mall. Um, we needed uh, both indoor and outdoor Wi-Fi as well as wireless backhaul. The reason is is that in some of the parks there are some buildings where we wanted some coverage inside um, as well as outside to cover things like uh, 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 base, baseball stands and, and those sorts of areas. Um, traffic meaning meaning foot traffic and, and, uh, and visitors is, is very uh, active. Um, there's a lot of sporting events, a lot of parades and other things going on, but you know, people use these areas on a regular basis as in their day-to-day -day lives as well. So these aren't just uh, kind of quiet out of the corner places. You know, the, the downtown pedestrian mall is quite busy at lunch as people come and go uh, from, from work, but the parks, of course, especially on weekends, are quite busy too with, with games and, and children and such. Um, and so we think and someone, you know, if anyone knows of another one, I definitely want to hear about it, but I've been asking and looking around for ages, but we think this is the first 
free municipal Wi-Fi network to support IPv6. Now, I realize that there are universities that have a similar model with a lot more users on a university campus, but I, I feel that it's a slightly different use case. Um, while, if, of course, a university would have random visitors showing up who are jumping on the network, to some extent, there's a large user base that I'm not going to say is controllable, but is supportable, right? You know who the students are. Um, if they have a problem, you know, they, know, may, they hopefully know who to call. While in a, a network like this, it's truly open access. Anyone can come along from anywhere and jump onto this network with no previous relationship with the network, you know, just like you would see at a Starbucks or something like that, but we're talking about a pretty wide area outdoors. Um, so again, we, we believe that this is the first network of its kind to support IPv6, but if anyone knows of any others that have done it before, I'd, I'd definitely love to hear about it. So, a little bit about the equipment we used. Um, this network is based on the AeroHive um, AP and their, and their Hive Manager, which is kind of like a controller, but not really. Um, and it's kind of like a controller in the cloud, but not really. Um, so we use two, the two different kinds of uh, APs. There's uh, the one on the left there, which is obviously the outdoor version, um, and then uh, and there are just a few, just eight of the indoor version, the AP330. Um, to connect these uh, uh, distant locations together, uh, we use the Ubiquiti uh, uh, AF24. So there's six of those because there's three of these uh, Ubiquiti links that connect the parks um, and downtown together. Within and then within these areas, you know, the, the meshing capability of the AeroHive equipment is mostly what's in use um, to create that local network. So just to give you an idea of the kind of areas we're covering, this is, this is that downtown area that I was talking about. Right in the middle there, um, from kind of the bottom left to the top right, is that pedestrian uh, uh, mall, that uh, pedestrian area. It's kind of like an alleyway. Um, but it's much nicer than an alley. Um, and you can see kind of our AP placements there. So it's really, you know, we're really talking essentially like three, you know, kind of normal city size blocks here. We're not talking a huge town, um, but, uh, but uh, you can see where we placed the APs. Um, this is Hunter Park. Um, you can see the areas that we decided to cover uh, mostly were surrounding the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the bleachers for the baseball diamonds, as well as some of the concession areas. Um, and then there's this little kind of uh, playground lake area park on the left um, that had a, a pretty good density of APs because there's, we see a larger density of users there. Um, so, so, you know, the, the trade-off here was not to cover the entire baseball diamond and the outfield, thinking that we wouldn't see a whole lot of users there, that most of the users would be in the stands and, and, and those kind of areas. And then at the top, you can see we, uh, we covered some, uh, some tennis, tennis courts as well. Uh, just Jesse Davis Park, similar kind of situation. Um, there's no, uh, no baseball diamonds on this one, but uh, um, placed the APs around the park based on the areas that we thought we would see the most usage. Obviously, there were some budget limitations here, so we didn't cover absolutely everything we could. Um, and there are more parks around, too, that we might expand the network to in the future as well. Uh, so just uh, just some deployment pictures, nothing terribly exciting here, uh, especially not for someone who's climbed a lot of towers, which I haven't and don't plan to. Um, I don't know how many people in here have done that, but uh, but uh, we uh, we sent some guys up there, uh, put these APs on. You can see that in the center picture there is the uh, is that uh, air fiber, the uh, the backhaul uh, radio. So. Um, um, our backhaul links are just layer two links, basically. They're pretty transparent to, uh, the, uh, to IP traffic. Uh, we didn't have any issues there. There was no real interaction there with IPv6. Um, so this is just kind of the status page for one of those links. Um, we were getting quite a bit of bandwidth there. Uh, you can see this link was uh, pretty stable at uh, about, I guess, just about 750 megabits. So nearly, nearly a gig worth of backhaul capacity from each of these locations. Of course, we don't have nearly that much upstream capacity for the entire network. Um, but the point is, is that gives us a lot of area to scale and grow this network over time. So why did we deploy IPv6? Well, I hope that's not a conversation I actually have to have with this audience. Uh, many other audiences would, would, would first ask, you know, why would you do all this extra work to do it? You know, we feel very strongly um, that 
V6 should be included in every project, especially greenfield projects that we do. And, and we practice that in, um, in pretty much all of our engagements. Our clients have to actively tell us to not install IPv6 if we're doing a greenfield install, in, in, installation for them. And we always include that in our basic consulting fees. So, but beyond it being the right thing to do, um, maybe the better way to look at this section of the presentation is about some tools that we all can use to help convince other folks about why it's the right thing to do. So um, what you see here is just a little excerpt of, uh, of an infographic we put together. You can see the full size version over at our table. I think it's on our website too. Um, but just giving some of the stats, it's all publicly available stuff that most people in this room have seen before. Um, but just collecting all that into one area so that we can then use this diagram to show to the mayor of the town, for example, or show to some other stakeholder who may not be terribly technical about what the trends are, excuse me, in IPv6 and, and, and IPv4 address availability, of course, um, and what uh, the whole landscape looks like. And we, ha we have like little uh, printouts of this too, if you want to take one home and use it with your own uh, conversations, you, you're certainly very welcome to do that. IPv6 is faster, I don't know. So uh, I, I really like this claim. I, I'm sure everyone's probably in here probably seen or heard this before. Uh, there was an excellent presentation by Lee Howard and, and several other folks at Nanog. I, I did not, this is not my work. I'm just pointing you to them because I think it's, it's fantastic work that they did. Um, so if you haven't actually seen that presentation from, from, from Lee Howard and, and uh, John Brzezowski and a few other folks, I definitely encourage you, the, the URL is here, but if you just go to YouTube and type it in, you can find it. It's definitely worth watching. They had some really interesting points about, um, about uh, IPv6 performance versus IPv4 performance and, and how, we've observed, how they've observed um, in at least certain situations where V6 was actually performing better. So sure, that's a good reason to do it. Is that going to be a long-term reason? I don't know about that. Um, I suspect that we'll see IPv4 and IPv6 performance converge pretty soon. Um, but on the other hand, we'll probably see V4 then get worse as more um, uh, NAT 4.4 and other kind of NATs show up out on the internet. So I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine, I suppose. But um, avoiding NAT alone should seem like a good enough reason to, to go ahead and deploy V6 to me. Uh, traffic volume is on the increase. This is just a screenshot from, from Akamai that we, that we captured. But we all know that IPv6 traffic is growing dramatically. Um, so there's yet another great reason to go ahead and include IPv6 in this network. Again, it was a greenfield network. There was nothing here that w before we started. So it was very easy to just turn it on on day one without having to do some complex migration plan or testing or, or, or complex support of existing um, clients. And of course, I'm sure you all know RFC 6540. I love RFC 6540. You must do IPv6 at least as well as IPv4. Um, if you don't know it, write down the number. Um, that way you can complain to everybody, hey, you're not RFC compliant if you're not doing I I IPv6. I just, I just love that argument. I think it's great to have that, that document out there. So some additional considerations as we were um, thinking about and designing this network. Um, and these are pretty typical considerations probably in any network design, but they're worth always talking about, I think, and going over them and understanding where the requirements of the network lie um, in, in uh, respect to each of them. So, so maintainability, first of all. Um, this network in particular, there's no 24 by 7 knock. There's no one watching this thing all the time. Um, sure, there's a maintenance contract that, uh, you know, if lightning hits a tower or, or, um, or, or something terrible happens or something fries, you know, sure, certainly there's a, there's a system to come and replace that. But this isn't the kind of network where someone's watching it all the time. So, as far as a maintainability point of view, it has to be easy. It has to be obvious to um, the city, because it's the city's primary, primary responsibility to maintain this network. When something's not working, how to determine it's not working, and then how to get that kind of support. But from a design perspective, we want to choose equipment that's not going to fail all the time, that's not going to need uh, you know, a, a configuration update every few, few weeks or every few months, and that sort of stuff. And, and so our decision to, to move with uh, AirHive was based on partially on that. Uh, scalability. We hope, we hope that the, the city finds more money and wants to expand this network to additional sites. Those sites could be additional parks, might be expanding that downtown area. We already had conversations about um, adding a few more blocks onto that coverage area. And it could be other facilities entirely. I believe we already added a, uh, a computer lab, for example, onto the network. Um, just for, uh, for underprivileged folks to, to come and use the lab. So, so we want to make sure that we can plug additional um, 
coverage into this network as we need to. Um, and so that was part of the consideration when we're looking at what kind of backhaul equipment to use. Uh, but also as, the, as far as the topology goes as well. Um, performance. We had a long conversation with both Google and the town about what kind of performance users should expect out of this network. You have to have that conversation to design anything. How, and that derives us directly to how big of an upstream bandwidth link do we need. And that, that took some time to work out as well. Um, you know, at first, everyone wants all the bandwidth they can possibly get until they see the price tag and realize that budgets are limited and we have to fit all that within the budget. Um, but what, 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 what went along with that conversation um, since performance was directly tied to how much upstream bandwidth we were going to have, was also making sure that anyone who could provide economical upstream bandwidth would also supply us native IPv6. We weren't going to build this network, or at least strongly didn't want to build this network, without a native upstream IPv6 connection. We certainly didn't want to have to tunnel around someone else's inability to do IPv6, so we wanted to make sure we selected that service provider properly. Um, and flexibility, which of course ties very much into both scalability and maintainability and all the other um, items. But we want to be able to add devices onto the network. We want to be able to support future devices that we may not be able to predict. And all those tie directly into how we made that decision. So what, what steps did we take? Um, Again, a lot of this is, is, is project management 101 or network design 101, but I think they're all important to talk about because I think we skip over these steps too much. And as we're deploying IPv6 um, in all kinds of places, I think it's important to think about kind of a, 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 a structured approach to how to put together those plans. So um, the first step is, and, and a lot of this is obvious, but identify your needs and your resources. What are your requirements? What are the network requirements? Uh, for IPv6 and for other functionality around the network. Um, so in this case, you know, we wanted to make sure we could get IPv6 addresses. Where were we going to get them? Um, could we go directly to Aaron for them? Well, we would have to be multi-homed, at least at that time. I know those rules have changed a little bit, um, which we weren't planning on doing. The cost was a little too high. So what we need to do is make sure that we could get IPv6 addresses from our upstream provider. Okay, no problem. But that also kind of came along with it, because this network is dual stack, that we need IPv4 addresses to come with that too. The, the county's IT department, rather the city's IT department, didn't have a ton of extra IPv4 addresses laying around, as you might imagine. Um, all of their internal stuff is NATed anyway, um, so the chances of being able to get any addresses from them was, was almost nil. Um, and we, we did have a goal, along with Google, of building this network so that it, trying to avoid NATs, not just an IPv6, but an IPv4 as well. Uh, we just think that's the right thing to do. Um, the whole idea of the network was to be totally publicly, ex you know, total public access. And while NAT alone, I don't think, is any kind of real invasion of privacy or any kind of content restriction, it, it gives you a choke point to do that. It, you know, as we all know, it, it does hurt performance, so why do it if we don't have to? So we had a couple, so that generated a couple requirements for this upstream provider. They had to be able to do IPv6 natively. They had to be able to give us at least a slash 24 of IPv4 address space. Um, and they had to be able to service the bandwidth at the, the location in Douglasville, which, again, is outside the major city, so there's not a whole lot of fiber out there. Um, ironically enough, since the Google data center is a couple miles away, but that's where the fiber is, not near, uh, not near the downtown area. Um, so, so that drove us to, to find those cable suppliers, um, but also on the, um, on the um, network uh, elements, right, the APs basically, we needed to make sure that they would be at least not blocking IPv6 if we were just going to bridge it through the network, which we did. And I have a little more details here after that. Um, and then, of course, I, I think you know, one of the most important considerations is on staff training and staff education. How are they going to operate this network, not just from an IPv6 perspective, but that would be the biggest stumbling block for the, county, for the city's IT department since they hadn't done IPv6 before. Um, so, so training was something we had to take into account, too, to make sure that the staff would be capable of operating it after, after we were done with the install. So we figured all that out. That took a couple months, lots of spreadsheets, lots of phone calls to lots of different vendors, and eventually settled down on, on a couple, you know, one service provider and, and, uh, and you know, our partners there, Ohio, for the equipment. Um, we, uh, we, of course, worked a lot with, this, with the city to determine exactly which areas of coverage we would have, and that changed a few times as we modified that budget up and down. Uh, but that all finally settled out so we could put together a deployment plan. 
Um, in this case, deployment plan, greenfield network, it's not really that big of a deal. We're not talking about you know, steps that we have to be executed in a particular order in order to make sure our existing users stay up because we didn't have any existing users. So deployment plan in this case is pretty simple. Let's do downtown first um, and then tie the parks into the downtown area. Um, and that's effectively what our deployment plan said. You know, in your own deployment plan, for if we're talking about IPv6 or even any other technology, obviously you're going to want to take into account um, any existing users or legacy network or legacy equipment or whatever else is going on in the network um, to figure out those steps. You know, and even even after doing this for nearly 20 years, I have to say that that. I can't do it unless I write it down first. I don't know, there's some people out there that might be able to do it, but I think a written deployment plan, even if it's not pretty with a bunch of fancy logos on it and exactly what to type is, is invaluable for any kind of network transition. So we'll do that. We have our deployment plan, and now let's lab it up. And let's make sure that our assumptions are correct. Let's make sure that the software actually works the way all the vendors say the software is going to work. Let's make sure that the service provider is actually going to deliver the bandwidth they say they're going to deliver. Um, in this case, again, since it's a greenfield network, we were able to do a lab in place. We were basically able to build part of the network and test it right there in its place before it went live. Um, in, other, um, in other deployments, you know, that's not possible because of existing legacy equipment or users or whatnot. Um, and labs, of course, are extremely valuable, but I'm sure you all know that. So we get it all tested, we get it deployed, everything's up and working, and then, you know, continuous improvement and monitoring, again, of any kind of network deployment is always critical. In this case, we have, might have a little less of that officially than we want, since, um, since like I said, there's no, uh, there's no official, like, 24 by 7 knock monitoring this all the time, but since we find this network to be particularly interesting and special to us, we, we tend to keep a close eye on it and log into the stuff every, you know, every few days just to see what's going on and keep up with the stats and look for problems. Um, there was a, uh, um, it's kind of funny, there was a, not funny, it's a little tragic, I suppose, but there was a, class, a, a, a historical building there that one of our APs was on um, that got hit with lightning or something a few months ago and it actually burned down and took our AP with it. Um, so. You know, we didn't we didn't notice that right away, but we noticed it a day or two later when uh, when we ne let next check the uh, the system status. We're like, hey, this AP's been offline for a couple of days. Where is it? And that's when <laughs> we were directed to the news story on the news about the building burning down. So um, it would be better if there was a a good you know uh, managed services contract on a network like this where someone was watching it 24/7. But again, it's an open access free network, so that wasn't the the, the choice was. We could either fund that or we could fund an extra park. So um, I would say that I would. I, I thought the decision was good to expand the coverage more than uh, than pay for the 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 kind of high reliability, since it is again a free network. Um, so the the configuration of the network really it's very straightforward. This is a kind of a classic dual stack network. Um, there's nothing super special going on here. We're using standard uh, RA and ND processes for, for bootstrapping, you get on the network um, uh, uh, via, via the standard process. Um, our RAs uh, advertise both the managed flag and the other configuration flags. So we can push DNS servers to the devices. Um, we had some debate a little bit, not a lot, but a little bit about whether we should use DHCP v6 or, not, or just Slack. Um, because we were a little afraid that some older devices that folks might have might not operate so well on the network um, if we tried to do DHCP because you know, all, there's some older devices that don't support it. But we decided that since we were doing dual stack, since V4 was available as well, um, and that um, DHCP gave us much better control over the network and much better visibility to what was going on, we decided that the trade-off was worth it to go ahead and go with the DHCP V6, and those older clients would end up being v4 only clients if they were unable to do DHCP v6. Um, but ultimately, you know, enough devices support it now, and, and we have some stats here in a minute I'll show you, um, to, that I think reinforces that decision that, uh, that there's not enough of those older devices around anymore for it to really matter. Um, we have an on-site DHCP v6 server that handles all the requests. Um, it also does DNS and also does some v4 stuff. Um, so this is very lightweight, just, uh, just a small server there that sits there on site. But what's important is all devices get global unique addresses, true of both v4 and v6 for that matter. Um, so this is, a, this is a true open access network with a real IP address that you get to talk to the, the real internet with. 
So, but there are some security concerns there and some security discussions. There's no firewall or content filtering here at all. So thank you, Google, for, 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 uh, for uh, uh, requiring that out of these networks because I didn't want to have to have the debate with a, with a local politician about whether porn should be blocked on their network or not. Um, I believe in open access networks. I think that's the best, that best idea too. Um, but uh, I didn't have to have that argument because that was done for me by, by the terms of the Google grant. Um, so Google's been very good about that in any of these grants that they do. They always require those, these networks to, to be completely open and not, there not to be any content filtering. Um, one problem though, the, uh, the transparent redirection software that's in there to, to show people a splash page when they get the, on the network only works in IPv4. So if you get on the network and don't go to a v4 only website at first, or if you actually configured your device to be v6 only, you'll never see the splash page. Now, in this network, I don't think that's that big of a deal since it's a free open access network anyway. The splash page has some AUP language on it or something, which we all know is unenforceable anyway, so who really cares? Um, but if you were building a network where this kind of thing is required, and, and, uh, and uh, Dave Farmer and I, I don't know if he's still in here, we were just talking about this the other day, I still don't know of any captive portal systems that really support IPv6. Um, so this can be a real problem if you did actually want to charge for service or if you really felt that your users had to agree to that AUP. Um, if there's one out there, any kind of NAC or captive portal that does do IPv6 well, I would love to hear about it. Please stop by or tell me uh, because our clients are looking for that a lot. Um, but as far as I know, there's no one out there really doing it well. There's, I know there's a little bit of open source, source software, but you really have to hack it up pretty badly um, to really make it work. So um, again, if you, if you know of one, we'd love to hear about it. Um, no RA guard, no DHCP v6 shield. Um, just those features are just not available on these networks yet. So man in the middle attacks are possible on these networks. But is that really any worse than IPv4? I don't think so. I think almost all Wi-Fi networks are pretty susceptible to that anyway. So while that's not an excuse for poor security, um, I think at least we're not making things worse, right? Um, but those kind of man in the middle attacks do bother me. Um, one of the things that I talk about a lot when I do these kind of presentations for um, enterprise and for uh, non-technical audiences is I talk a lot about, you know, the Wi-Fi in this very building, because your device has a default IPv6, probably has IPv6 enabled by default, I can send out RAs because the network in this building, not this literal building, but this hotel or your campus probably isn't blocking any IPv6 traffic. I can probably send you an RA with a default route and hijack all of your traffic because you're not even looking for IPv6 traffic. Do a NAT, quick NAT64 on it and send it out to the regular internet over IPv4 and I could be this man in the middle that you'd never notice. And that usually terrifies a, uh, an enterprise client that, hey, we need to do something about this IPv6 stuff. Hopefully the conclusion isn't, oh boy, we better turn it all off. Um, but, uh, but I find that to be a very useful conversation starter too. So some results. Um, it's, a, it's an active network. It's certainly by far not the biggest Wi-Fi network in the world. Um, we regularly see about 100 users, sometimes a little bit more. Um, during special events, it's very common to see more than 200 users on the network. Um, and we don't really receive any user complaints at all. Um, now again, this is an open access free network, so chances of someone complaining or even knowing who to complain to might be somewhat small. Um, but, uh, but there's certainly vocal members of the community that know where the network came from and know why it's there and they know to call the mayor's office or something like that if they were really upset about it or if it really didn't work. And we haven't really seen any of that. Um, we haven't really seen any requests for tech support from the city to, uh, around IPv6 at all. Um, most of the requests we get is, hey, uh, you know, this AP fell offline and usually it's because of a power issue or, or it got fried by lightning or something like that. So, so what, I'm, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say there is that we have this open network. No one's configuring anyone's devices on it. There's no NAC. There's no enforcement of really anything. But yet, uh, we don't get a whole lot of complaints and people are actively using it every single day. Uh, we see new devices logging on all the time. Um, you know, as people, you know, come to town to have lunch or drive through or whatever, their devices connect to the network, um, and they and they use V6, and uh, and there's no interaction uh, ahead of time to set up anything or or, um, or or provide really any support. We do see some abuse complaints, uh, mostly like DMCA stuff. Um, so there's probably someone sitting in a cafe, you know, you know. Uh, 
downloading movies or porn or something like that, or hosting it rather, is probably where the DMCA complaints come from. Of course, those users are all gone by the time anyone gets around to actually acting on any of those complaints. And I don't think we've seen any of them in V6 yet. Um, if we did, that I, that I might have missed it. Now, I'm not saying that there's not DMCA uh, stuff going on out there that's looking to V6, but we haven't, we haven't seen it on this network at least. So usage, um, you can see it's, it's pretty steady over time. This is uh, the last few months to August. I believe this is in, um, in gigabits per day. Um, so it's not gigabits per second or anything like that. But we, we're seeing you know, almost, almost 2,000 gigabits per day. So that's, that's, that's pretty healthy for, <clears throat> for a network like this, I think. Um, more interesting stat might be a you know, total number of concurrent users. This is our graph of our DHCP leases. I think the leases are set fairly long, um, so this is probably a little bit overstated, but you can see, you know, most days we're seeing 100, 120, 150 uh, DHCP, uh, simultaneous DHCP leases. Um, so that, you know, it's quite a few people, even if it's only half of that because of the lease time, still 70, 80 people on the network uh, uh, simultaneously, I think is a, is a pretty big deal for such a small town and such a small network. Um, we, so, as I was saying before, we see a lot of clients come through town. This is uh, unique clients over time. Um, so you can see 2.4 gig actually is still insanely popular, so there's definitely still a good number of older devices out there. Um, but, uh, but you can see, you know, we had a, this, this peak of 750 unique Wi-Fi clients on 20th September. That was, that's a lot of unique clients for such a small network. I, I think so, at least. And again, no complaints, no user complaints as far as we know. Nearly all of them are using IPv6 in some way or another. Um, this is a, a uh, traffic graph showing the percentage of traffic that is IPv6 on the network at any particular time. The, uh, it's probably a little hard to read the key at the bottom, um, but the green is the inbound IPv6 percentage of traffic, while the blue is the outbound IPv6 percentage of traffic. So you can see on the green line, it's the higher line, we're bumping up near 40%. Again, this is a network where no one's specifically enabled IPv6 on anyone's device. It's just random devices coming through town. Um, so uh, default configs seem to be working quite well. In order for us to see what's, what's approaching half of the traffic on this network being IPv6, um, I think it's pretty incredible. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely well above 30 at the peak now. Um, and I would, based on the growth rates that we've seen, I would predict within Within a year or so, I bet we'll see a, a true 50% of the traffic on this network being IPv6. And that's traffic by volume. So some, just, uh, just some conclusions around that. Um, IPv6 is, is working really well in the real world, even in this uncontrolled environment where, um, where we don't have any visibility into the clients at all. Um, a lot of you probably know that from your own deployments, uh, but it, it still comes as a pleasant surprise to me. I, I, I still expect there to be more problems. I expect someone to wake up one day and call me in a panic and say, oh my gosh, all devices from manufacturer Foo don't work. We didn't realize this for the last six months, and that's because they have some sort of weird bug or incompatibility or something with IPv6. We just haven't seen that, and this network's been around for about a year now. Um, so if there's anything like that going on, we're certainly not hearing about it. Um, I, don't know, I put IPv6 as faster as a conclusion. I don't know if that's really true or not, but I like it. I think it's fun to think about. Um, and again, I do feel very strongly that as we see more and more NATs go into place, that that will become even more true. Um, so even even if it might be a you know a, a questionable claim right now, uh, I think we'll see it. Uh, I think we'll see it definitely grow quite a bit. Um, so there were some challenges to V6, you know, mostly in the planning stages, thinking about how we wanted to do it. But, um, but for the most part, it just worked. Like this was, this didn't take, you know, 20 year veterans in the industry to build this network. I, I like to think so. I got paid for doing it. I love doing it. But I, I, I don't think it took that level of effort or that level of expertise to make this work so well. I think, I think a, a, you know, a good solid network engineer with a good fiver or eight years of experience with some lab work on IPv6 would have been able to make this network work and work pretty well. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not show stopping. Um, as we all know in here, you know, a huge amount of internet content these days is available over IPv6 and that's what's driving, you know, the 40% usage number now. Um, so we're very excited about that. We're very excited to see that continuing. Of course, all of you in this room are helping that. 
Um, I put 30%, but it's really more like 40% now. About 30% of Douglas's traffic is, uh, uh, is V6, and that's up 10% from just about six months ago. Um, it's maybe, yeah, about six months ago. So uh, the, the, growth is, the growth is incredible, um, and that's thanks to, to the efforts of everybody deploying, all the content providers providing all that content in V6. So um, I'm a little ahead of schedule, but not too much. What, what questions? Anybody have any questions? We've got the microphone here, so uh, if you have questions, raise your hand, and then uh, I'll. Sorry. You could you could fix your last bullet on your conclusions. You probably saw it. Yeah, I just saw that. <laughs> I, I skipped over it and pretended like no one else did. <laughs> you knew I'd have to bring it up. Uh, during any inclement weather, have you seen any degradation from your statistics? Um, so yes, but not in the way I think you. Th you're thinking about it. So what we see is we can almost tell what the weather was like on a particular day based on how many users there were, right? So, so uh, I, don't, I had another graph, but I didn't, didn't show it on here, uh, where the last couple of days the weather's been kind of cold and a little bit rainy, I think, in the area. And so we saw a, a definite drop in the number of users and the amount of bandwidth on the network. But as far as, as, far as performance goes, I mean, surely in, in very inclement weather, especially our backhaul links, like I showed you, we're about 700 meg now. I mean, they'll, they'll drop down in speed to a couple hundred meg or, um, or something like that um, to, to deal with the rain fade. Um, but since the, since the network, especially those times in inclement weather, doesn't have a high demand, it shouldn't really ever matter, I don't think. I think it cancels the ad. I think, I think when the weather's bad enough, no one's really using it anyway. And then, like I mentioned, you know, there was a... I think there was a tornado a few months ago, and that messed up a few APs, mostly because it took down the power, and I think some of the power like bounced up and down real fast, and I think that might have might have confused some APs. But um, but other than those things, uh, it's been pretty, it's been quite stable. Another question? Um, yeah, I'm just curious about your selection of Arrowhive for the wireless APs. Um, we did an RFP about nine months ago, and I think believe at that time. They were saying they did not have a, an answer to V6. And when I do a search on their website, the only hit for IPv6 I see is a white paper about a certain municipal Wi-Fi network in <laughs> Douglasville. Yeah, the, so, so what we found was that really none of the wireless providers had what I would consider a sufficient feature set for IPv6. And, and I don't know if that's changed in the last couple months. I haven't looked really closely extremely recently. but. As of, as certainly as of about a year ago, I tried to do kind of my own compiled list of what features which Wi-Fi vendors made, and I made a nice spreadsheet and it had a bunch of titles like RA Guard and DHCP Shield and like, you know, maybe does their built-in DHCP server support V6, does their management system support V6, and I, and I put a bunch of vendors down the list and I tried to find all the info, and I couldn't put a single X on the entire spreadsheet. So uh, it, my conclusion was, was that none of them really do it. Um, hopefully some of them will soon. Um, but, uh, but then we ended up just making those decisions based on, on other factors like maintainability and scalability, especially the maintainability part because the, uh, I, I would say probably the, the two biggest driving factors were not at all IPv6 in that selection, but was number one, the, the cloud-based controller, they call it Hive Manager, um, because that was easy to use and that the city could figure it out pretty easily. And the, the meshing um, protocol we thought worked pretty well. And since this was an outdoor mesh, uh, we were pretty dependent on it being a mesh because there just wasn't really an option of running Ethernet cables from each of those buildings. They're too far apart and we'd end up having to buy circuits for the telephone company and that would blow out the budget. So, Over here. How did you architect the um, address layout? Did you do a slash 64 for every AP, or did you do something larger? Yeah, I, me I meant to mention that. This is a very simple network. It's just a flat layer two for the whole thing. So there's a one slash 24 of IPv4, there's one slash 64 of IPv6, and that's really it. Yeah. yeah. We're seeing a peak about 200 users, so we're pretty comfortable with that right now. If that grows a lot more, I, then we'll, we'll need to think about how else we might want to split it up, maybe put a routed interface between one of the parks and downtown, or maybe both of the parks. It would be pretty easy to add that if we need to. So, so does that mean you're using Slack for the V6, and, and therefore it couldn't be a V6 only client? You have to use V4 to pick up like DNS and things today. No, no, we have we have um, the uh, we have the uh, uh, managed 
bit set and we have the other bit set. Okay. So uh, it's all DHCP v6. Okay. So have you tried to see if a v6 only client would function and could do everything? If it didn't have a V4 stack at all? So a V6 only client, yes. A V6 only client can do everything a V6 only client can do, which is yeah. reach the <laughs> places that have native V6. Yeah. But we're not doing any translation. There's no NAT64 or anything like that. So if you're V6 only, you're really V6 only. Yeah. But yeah, there's no there's no transition mechanism in here at all. It's it's just plain dual stack. There's no no NAT of any kind, no no uh, no transition stuff, no tunnels either. Any other questions? Wow, well, I'm not usually this far ahead of schedule. <laughs> I have the, my little resources page here. I'm, I'm, most of you have seen all these URLs probably before, but um, in case you wanted uh, any quick references, you know these are the the, the kind of stuff, the kind of sites that we use a lot. I would find very useful. Um, and then um, and then that's it. Thank you very much.